Hello and welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast presented today by Fantrax. I am joined today by my good buddy Ryan Boyer. Today is March 9th, Saturday. We're going to be doing the over-unders again. This time we are moving to the central divisions, but there are a couple of quick headlines that we have to get into. First big one, Ryan, is Noel V. Marte suspended 80 games for testing positive for a PED injury. Or PED injury. Well, I guess it's an injury to something. Uh this is a big one because I think Marte was considered a fantasy sleeper by a lot of folks. Sleeper may be even uh, an understatement. The guy that was getting top 100 consideration in a lot of drafts after a strong showing uh, for Cincinnati at the end of the year. One of the top prospects in baseball, obviously, as a Mariner fan, I'm well familiar with him. Uh, traded in the Luis Castillo blockbuster. Maybe the Mariners did win that trade, Ryan, but... I'm very curious to your thoughts. Is Lou is Noel Ve Marte somebody that you're still drafting, or what are your expectations for him for the rest of 2024 now that you know it's going to be so short? I don't know that you can use a redraft pick on him. Mm. Uh, it depends on the on the league. I mean, if sure. you board the sash, I, do le- any leagues have PED slips? I've never sash. played in one. I don't think so, but um, I mean, obviously, if you have like super deep rosters and you can af- afford to stash him, then great. But and he's going to miss eighty games. Um, that puts like mid late June. Um, what is the role going to be when he comes back? I mean, you David Bell made it sound like he's he'll basically slide right back into the role that they were anticipating he was going to have when he does return. Um, but obviously that's a, there's a long time between now and, and then, so lots of stuff can change. Um, I mean, if there's a silver lining, I guess the reds have already had too many infielders. So yeah. offers a little bit of clarity. It's still not super clear what exactly they're going to do. I mean, Jarmer Candelario is going to basically be the everyday third baseman now, I guess. Um, still going to spend a little bit of time at first base, but now we'll handle third base predominantly. Um, Christian and Carnosian Strand can mostly play first and yep. maybe some more at-bats at designated hitter as well. Jonathan India could see a little uptick in playing time with uh, maybe some starts at third, maybe some starts at DH. I think it probably just gives like – an extra start per week to like India and Will Benson and Jake Fraley and all those guys. It'll probably be fairly even until someone kind of steps up and shows that they deserve more of those starts. But yeah, as far as Marte goes, big bummer. Yeah. Number's good. But his bad at ball data. I mean, he, he absolutely crushed the ball last year with the Reds. And that's a very enticing ballpark. Certainly, sure. he's going to be playing in, and now we got to we got to wait till June to see him. Yeah, yeah, it's a bummer, man, because he is certainly one of the better young talents in baseball. And you mentioned the ball, uh, the batted ball data, and just the overall talent. This has been a guy that people have had their eye on for a very long time. Some people surprised that Seattle was willing to give him up, even to get an ace like Luis Castillo. It kind of sounds like, based on what you were saying, though, Ryan that this doesn't really put anybody's stock up on the Reds either. I think if anyone probably in Carnarvon Strand, yeah. um, his at-bats are a little more assured. I mean, he's going to have to play well because they do still have other options. But I sure. if you spent his draft, his ADP is probably going to tick up after this, I would guess. So the other real quick headline that I wanted to go over is Mookie Betts. Uh, Mookie Betts is going to be the shortstop for the Los Angeles Dodgers in a quote that everyone is making fun of as Dave Roberts called it permanent for now, which is some definitely maybe BS that we all love to see. Um, Lux really has been struggling defensively and then pointed out the fact that he looked so good defensively at second base in 2022. Any fantasy ramifications from this other than the very, very obvious one that if Mookie Betts doesn't have shortstop eligibility, he's going to have it. Yeah, and then I don't know if you saw, but Lux in the 
yesterday, bounced a couple throws to yeah. base. So he's something's going on there. Yeah. Um, I I don't really know what the Dodgers are doing. Like they built this like super team, and then they're going to put Mick, Mookie Betts at, at shortstop. I, I don't Weird. don't understand why they're. Well, they wouldn't just put Miguel Rojas as a really good defender, and they don't need his bat. Sure. Miguel Rojas at shortstop and bat him ninth. And I guess they're optimistic that Gavin Lux can provide a, a spark offensively. Uh, maybe he can, former top prospect, but he hasn't really shown that much yet. It's, it's an odd situation. But, I mean – Mookie Betts put put nothing past Mookie Betts, I guess. Um, he's out. He's bowling three hundred games. He's yeah. going from Gold Glove right fielder to starting shortstop in in his thirties. Um, not sure how many people could be, could pull that off, but yeah, the added eligibility. I think he had twelve, maybe twelve starts, like sixteen games total at shortstop. So if you're in the twenty game threshold, he he should not have eligibility yet but should pick that up early on imagine trading mookie bets like imagine being a major league baseball team and trading mookie bets it still baffles my mind and the amount of people who defended that trade who i just basically said well, well that person just doesn't know what the heck they're talking about because to say they have lost that trade to ryan i'm sorry to bring it back to the red sox and red sox fans especially after we crapped on him pretty much throughout our over under last week. Um, yep. Man, it's just amazing. Do you uh, knowing that he can play short, move him up at all in the drafts or uh, just the ability to play second base keeps him in that top three or four. I mean, the kind of the two to what six or so is basically a coin flip. Uh, and Mookie Betts is in that group. So, I mean, if you want to use that as a tiebreaker, I, I'm good with that. Um, it's certainly, I mean, dual eligibility is great. Triple eligibility, even better. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, my buddy Kansas City Moose here asked if he wasn't going to resign. What did you expect him to do? Oh, I don't know. Resign him and actually offer him a contract because it's absolute nonsense. Everyone I've talked to has said that Mookie Betts absolutely would have been willing to sign a contract if not for the horrendous low ball offers he got at the beginning. He said of the that time. himself. He, he said if he would have gotten the same offer from the Red Sox he would have, that he signed yeah. with the Dodgers, he would have yeah. signed with the Red Sox. So. Yeah, and Mookie Betts isn't going to lie about that. Like, they, There's no benefit to him saying something like that. He should have – the the PR thing to say there is, I wanted to be a Dodger through and through. No, he could have been a Boston Red Sox. He should have been a Boston Red Sox. Yeah. Bad trade. All right, let's get into these over-unders, and let's start with one of the worst teams in baseball, on paper anyway, and the Chicago White Sox. Uh, by the way, these over-unders are not pulled from Vegas except for the win totals. We will go over their over-unders. The rest of them are made up. When I start seeing more of those over-under totals on the actual websites that you can make bets on, we will include them. Hopefully, we will have them for next week. Let's start with Dylan Cease, who I think was one of the most disappointing players in 2023 biggest issue for cease has always been command over under dylan cease a 1.25 whip in 2024 i'm gonna take the over i mean it's so two out of the last three years i believe he's been under that but last year he was like he was well over it like one four one or something like that whip sure. um the White Sox defense, I think, sh maybe sh will be a little better. Yeah. All the young, sadly, is probably a significant defensive upgrade over Tim Anderson. Um, but, you know, I don't know if that's enough. I mean, Dylan Cease, we, his walk rate, training in the wrong direction, already wasn't in a great spot before. Um, Cease is a perfectly – good fantasy option in spite of his high whip but I, i'm going to take the over on the 125 yeah i'm going to take the over too i'm going to guess it's going to be in that 1.3 1.35 range which still a solid fantasy option if it was in that 1.25 or lower rate 
I'd be really excited about him because that makes him an actual fantasy ace, but he is someone who hurts more than helps in that category. If we're being completely honest with you, uh, maybe you're not pairing Dylan Cease with like a miles Miklas or anybody like that, because you know that there are going to be base runners that happen because he just, this has been an issue since he was in high school is that throwing strikes has been a bit of a conundrum for him kind of figured things out a little bit in 2022, but they were not good in 2023. Maybe trying to do a little too much, you know? And so maybe if he's playing on a better team, that gets better. But uh, I'm a little bit uh, worried about Cease in the whip category, to say the least. Uh, Eloy Jimenez, one of my favorite offensive players, happened to be traded with Dylan Cease in a trade that I think the uh, Cubs maybe don't look back on too fondly. Over or under 74.5 RBI, which is another way of saying, can Eloy Jimenez stay healthy in 2024? Yeah, can he stay healthy? And how is the White Sox offense going to point to? Add the, I mean, just look at Luis Roberts' numbers from last year. What he hit 33 home runs and had like 80 RBI. So I think the combination of the health history and the lack of supporting cast i gotta take the under on this i hope i'm wrong he looks mm -hmm. great far this spring he's currently healthy i hope they he plays 162 games Me all too. spots don't bother with him in the outfield he's right always been the least athletic like ever since he's uh been in the majors sure he's very awkward um but i hope he stays healthy but I, those two things are just working against him so i, I gotta take the under I'm going to take the over in part because I don't think Eloy Jimenez is playing for the Chicago White Sox in July. I think that he is going to be, if he gets off to it, especially if he gets off to a nice start, obviously if he's struggling, maybe they don't move him and sell him for 50 cents on the dollar. But I just think this team is such in rebuild mode that I do think he'll play for a better team, get a chance to hit in the middle of a decent lineup. So I will take that over. If he stays in Chicago, I'm probably taking that under. He screams the type of guy who could hit 28 to 30 home runs and drive in 70 RBI. That didn't used to be very common. It's becoming a lot more common lately. Um, I think Luis Robert is also a guy that I thought about doing some over-under stuff with that could be putting up some awfully high totals, but ne not necessarily driving in runs because the lineup behind him is just not very good. Words that I'm not allowed to say on this podcast. 50 RBI in the last last two months for a contender for Eloy Jimenez is what we're predicting. There we go. Perfect. Uh, one of the guys who might, well, he might actually be getting driven in by this guy, which I think maybe hurts the total a little bit. Uh, Andrew Vaughn has had kind of a little bit of an up and down over under a seven 50 OPS maybe set this one a little too low to be honest I was thinking about going like 770 but I'll just see how big a fan you are of Andrew Vaughn over under 750 OPS yeah I'm not a huge fan but I'll take a the over just by a little bit I mean he he was a little under that last year I, I think it's fair to guess that he'll tick up those numbers a little bit um he's certainly fallen short of expectations everybody since the day he was drafted, it was like, yeah. you can plug this guy in the middle of a big league lineup tomorrow and he's going to be a slugger. Just hasn't worked out that way. And there's no real indication that he's going to be a superstar, but he can just tick up those numbers a little bit and get above that 750 mark, I think. Yeah, but my concern here is that the approach has been pretty bad. He was in a walked only 5.9% of his plate appearances last year. That's not going to get the job done. And he doesn't have elite power. Like he's shown raw power, but in game power, we're talking more on the scouting scale 55 to 60, which, you know, works. 55 to 60 can give you 20 to 25 homers. But when you're playing first base and you're not drawing a ton of walks, one of the two has to go up. Like, this is going to be a really interesting situation. I think that's why they would have loved the outfield to work out. So, uh, for Andrew Vaughn, it did not, <laughs> to say the very, very least. Andrew Vaughn or Eloy Jimenez, which one would you rather see catching fly balls? Might be an interesting uh, little debate. I think the answer is just no thank you. I'm going to take the over, but not by a whole heck of a lot. And this is the thing about right, right first baseman. Like, every once in a while, you get a Pete Alonzo. Yeah. A lot of them just don't work out because the bat has to max out in order for it to work out. Ryan, I think it's pretty obvious that we're not a huge fan of this team, but this is a low over under. It's 63 wins. You taking the over or the under for the pale hose? And 61 wins 
last year. Um, do we think they're going to be better? Yeah. I mean, the only thing that can save them is their division is just absolutely horrendous. Yeah. But I have to take the under just because I think they're probably worse than they are last were last year, if that's possible. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take the under as well. And I think we're going to have some haves and have nots in baseball. Again, there are going to be some really good baseball team. There are going to be some 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. And I think the white Mm -hmm. Sox qualify for that. Uh, Tony LaRusso, we still don't owe you an apology. Uh, Let's move on to the Cleveland guardians who are one of the favorites for this division, but it's be darting with faint praise. Let's start with Gavin Williams. Uh, Kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit because Tanner Bybee was so good, but Gavin Williams was pretty good as well. Over under at 8.99 K9 for Gavin Williams in 2024. Yeah, he was good, but the strikeouts were a bit of a disappointment. Right. um, Fair to say, but I I think I'm going to go way over on this. Um, I think the the numbers from the minors, I mean, he struck out like 12 for nine in the minors. Big jump up, obviously, against big league competition. But again, that division is going to be pretty bad. Um, balance schedule, you know, sure. a little bit, but you know he's going to face those AL Central teams plenty, and he he just he has the stuff of a bat mister. Um, and I also I also trust the Guardians when it comes to pitchers. Sure, and be able to to coax that swing and mix miss out of him. Yeah, I'm going to go over as well. I think Williams is being severely underdrafted right now in leagues. I like his stuff a lot. I actually think he's the better long-term pitcher between him and Bybee, even though Bybee was very good in 2024 or 2023, and I think he'll be good in 2024 as well. Uh, the rotation is not going to be the issue for the Guardians. Like That's not going to be the issue, and I think Gavin Williams will probably return I would guess right around top 125 value, and he's being drafted well under that, which doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense for me. Uh, here's kind of a fun one. Uh, Emmanuel Class A, 28.5 saves over under with Cleveland. Are you betting on over with Cleveland, or are you thinking maybe uh, a trade could be in the works before he can reach that total? I did notice that you very, very much pointed out the with, with Cleveland part. Yeah. So this, that number seemed... Low, and I was like, oh, he's... <laughs> yeah, we did hear the, we have heard the trade rumors involving Class A. Um, I'm going to bet that he's going to get the over, and he's probably going to stay there. Hmm. If, if, what incentive exactly do the Guardians have to trade him now? His contract is like crazy cheap. Yeah. Um, unless they're a little worried about him, which. Right. His numbers did decline a little bit last year. Um, I think that's worth keeping an eye on, but he's led the maybe all of baseball, but certainly at least the American League two years in a row in saves. Um, and again, Cleveland, good pitching staff, bad offense, should lead to a lot of close games. I mean, he might even get 29, even if he is traded at the <laughs> traded at the deadline. That's, yeah. That would be quite a quite an ask. But I'm gonna I'm gonna guess he's gonna remain with the Guardians and he's gonna he's gonna cruise past that 28 and a half. I'm gonna take the over and still say he gets traded. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> well, I'm actually kind of mad because you stole my point. But like because I think Cleveland's gonna yeah, that's okay. Cleveland's gonna play so many close games. I think that he's going to hit that total. And I just think the Guardians, the way they operate, they're gonna look at it. Yes, the contract is cheap, but they want to deal guys at their highest point in value. And I think they a little bit regret not dealing Shane Bieber when he was at his highest point in value based on some folks that I've talked to. I don't think they're going to make that mistake. I'm putting quotation marks for anybody who's not watching on YouTube right now. By the way, thank you to everybody who's watching on YouTube. We really appreciate it. Uh, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. We appreciate it on all formats. We really do appreciate that. But I do think Emmanuel Class A, I'm going to say gets traded to somebody like the Dodgers uh, around the middle of July. And then one of the reasons why I think you could see him traded is I do not like this offense whatsoever, but I'm a little bit intrigued by Bo Naylor, um, the brother of Josh Naylor, one of the better catching prospects in baseball. He looks like he's going to get a really good shot here. Bo Naylor over under 20 homers in 2024. 
I like Bo Naylor as well. I am going to take the under here, though. I just think it's it's a lot for a young catcher in his yeah. full time full full season at the big league level. Sure, I expect the most out of him offensively when he's got so much other stuff to deal with in addition to the you know the wear and tear behind the plate. So I think he's going to be a perfectly solid fantasy option. He's one of those rare catchers who actually offers a little bit of speed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll take he's, I'm guessing like 17, 18 home runs. So perfectly solid fantasy option, but I'll take the under on that. So I'm glad you brought up the speed because I'll ask you this too. How about over under? I'm just making up the number. 18 and a half steals for Naylor in 2024. You blurred out a little bit. What and what and a half? 13 and a half. 13. So I'll put that. Um, I'll take the over. Okay. On. Nice. So that's interesting because that makes him a lot more fantasy relevant than I think uh, he's being given credit for. I'm going to take the under on the homers as well. It's probably going to be right around that 18 to 20 homer range, but I wouldn't doubt if there are some droughts for him homer wise. You know, they could be in spurts, as we often see for a lot of players. A 24 year old uh, only barreled the baseball 8.2 percent of the time. Expected slugging percentage last year 379. A fairly small sample. I think Bo Naylor is extremely underrated, by the way, in OBP leagues because he has an excellent approach at the plate. Walked 13% of the time. Uh, approach seemed to get better as he was a prospect going forward, which is what we like to see. I do like Bo Naylor. Probably going a little bit under on the homers, but the fact that he can steal some bases, really like to have him as my catcher too. Cleveland's one of the most tough teams, I think, for the over-under, Ryan. They've got him at 79.5. What is your take here? I agree. I struggled with this one. Um, yeah. I don't really like them as a team on the whole, but again, the division. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing like 80 wins. So I guess I'm technically taking the over here, even though I don't feel great about it. But their chances of winning that division um, or just being playing, playing very good. Uh, but I think they'll just eke out the over there. All right, we're going to take a look at the rest of the AL Central and then move on to the NL Central. But first, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Fantrax is the most customizable fantasy platform in the industry, offering the greatest fantasy experience for your dynasty, keeper, redraft, and best ball leagues. Are you coming from another service? Fantrax makes it very easy. Fantrax can import any of your current leagues and customize if needed player pool in the industry, including minor league players. Do you need a customizable commissioner service for your fantasy league? Fantrax can offer that customization more than any other platform. They've got waivers, categories, scoring systems, schedules. They offer custom solutions for all that and more. Of course, the best part of all of that, put your wallet away because it's free. And if you sign up for free today, enter to win an official MLB signed jersey from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. You simply go to Fantrax.com slash Rotowire and sign up today. That's F-A-N-T-R-A-X dot com slash Rotowire. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. All right, let's get to the Tigers, who <laughs> I think we thought they were going to be fairly interesting last year. They weren't, but I think they're on paper again, a little more interesting. We'll see if they fool me again. Let's start with Spencer Torkelson, who I don't think is getting nearly enough credit for how good he was in the second half of the season. I went a little aggressive here, Ryan, but based on what I saw in the second half, I think it's worth asking. Spencer Torkelson over under a 480 slugging percentage in 2024. Yeah, I'm going to take the over. It is, it is pretty aggressive, but believe in the power breakout. Yeah. Um, he's obviously not in the most ideal park, um, but Comerica better for right handed batters, so it doesn't hurt him as much. I don't know if you've checked out the expected. Uh, Home runs on Spencer Torkelson on on uh, stat and Statcast, but oh. there are five different parks where he would have hit forty home runs last wow. year. Wow, that's yeah, interesting. His, his expected home run total was like four and a half. Uh, he should have had four and a half more home runs. They say. Wow. So, legitimate power from Torque. Um, again, not the best lineup, not the best ballpark, but. I think, I think I'm going to take the over on that 480. Yeah, I think so as well. I, I think that Spencer Torkelson is going to be 
a masher in this league and there was a reason he was the first overall pick. Wouldn't have been my choice for the first overall pick if I'm being completely honest with you, but that's no insult to him. It's more a compliment to a couple of guys who went after him. I mean, this was a guy who hit the ball hard 50.9% of the time and he barreled the baseball 14.1% of the time. The, the park's a good point. I have some concerns about driving and runs. My biggest concern was Spencer Torkelson. He's an awful defensive player. Like he is... The idea that he was a third baseman at first was absolutely laughable, but he's a bad first baseman as well. I'll be curious to see how many we're talking about a long-term DH, I think, which I think could hurt his long-term fantasy option. I'm sure they'll give him every chance to be a first baseman because he's not slow. Like his average sprint speed of 27.4 would beat Ryan, would not beat me, but would definitely beat Ryan. Um, it's not bad. It, it's, it's not like the athleticism. He's just a terrible defensive player. But long story short, I do like Torkelson to slug over that 480 mark. Wouldn't shock me if he was in that 515 range. Uh, Colt Keith, a uh, prospect who was signed to a contract before playing, seen lots of examples of this working out well. We have seen lots of Evan White. Colt Keith over under 17.5 homers in 2024. Uh, I decided to throw Evan White under the bus. Didn't Sorry, you? Evan. Great defensive player, by the way. He is the opposite of Spencer Torkelson in every way. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go under on this. Um, again, gonna go back to Comerica, and this time Keith is a left-handed batter, so it's gonna take quite a poke to to clear that to clear that wall. Yeah, uh, and you know he's a rookie. Is the power gonna completely manifest in this first year? I think he's going to be perfectly fine, but I'm not counting on a ton of fantasy value in his first year from Cole, Cole Keith. Um, so I'm going to take the under on the 17 and a half home runs. I'm going to take the over, but not by a whole heck of a lot. This is a guy who hit 27 homers now in AAA and playing some in AA as well. But I do think that there's plus power here. I have some concerns about the other numbers. Like, I do not think this is a guy who's going to hit for the, nearly as high average as he did in the minor leagues, a career 300 hitter there, 894 OPS, by the way, career. Um, that power is going to have to be there because while he gets a chance to play up the middle, he is not a speed demon. He has stolen all of 11 bases in the minor leagues, and I don't think he's going to get that chance. I like him better long term, uh, but I still think he's got a chance to give you 20 homers or so. If he doesn't, he is pretty much fantasy irrelevant in my humble estimation. And I want him to be fantasy relevant. I like rookies. Uh, Tariq Skubal over under 199.5 strikeouts. Ryan, I love Tariq Skubal. <clears throat> He's uh, certainly been one of the buzzier names this spring and, and towards the end of last year as well. Um, I'm going to take the over 199.5. I mean, that's a big ask. Yeah. Um, He's had, we don't know what the workload is going to look like, but I mean, I think if he gets to 150 innings, he can get 200 strikeouts. Yep. Um, so I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the over. He, the, can the velocity uptick, can he, can that hold? I mean, he just looks absolutely lights out so far this spring, carrying it over and then some from the end of last year. So just. So and uh, hopefully we'll get the workload up enough to where you can cruise past that 200 strikeout mark. Yeah, I'm going to take the over as well. Now, this is obviously a big bet on health because this is a player who threw only 80 and a third innings last year, 117 and two thirds innings in 2022. So there is obviously injury risk that is associated with every pitcher, but especially I think scooball you have to be. But I just look at the Savant page, by the way, to rank in 96 percentile in strikeout percentage and in walk rate just tells you how flipping good this guy was to end the year. By the way, can you tell me any pitchers that were better than him in expected ERA last year? No, you can't. It was a 2.30. It was the very best in baseball. I'm going to take the over. I'm certainly taking the over on the rate for him to get 200 strikeouts. Sure. But I just think this breakout is coming. I would not shock me one bit. If Tariq Skubal, even playing for a not great baseball team, is SP1 next year, the stuff and the command are that good. It's interesting here. Uh, it seems like we like two of these guys at least a lot. Over under of 80.5 wins scares the heck out of me for the Detroit Tigers. Yeah, that's that's a little high. I, I think I'm going to take the over, though. Um, 
I like them a little more than the than the Guardians this year. We'll see if the they actually had I think they actually finished with a couple more wins than Cleveland last year. Um, and they're certainly more on the on the upswing. I think they could be pitchers for the Miners um, being a factor as well. What are, you, are we going to get uh, Jackson Joby up first half, second half? Good. Maybe. Um, Casey Mize, hopefully can stay healthy. Is he oh, be great? He looks good so far this spring as well. Yeah. Um, and again, the division is is bad. So I'm going to take the take the over. Yeah, I'm probably going to take the over too. But this team kind of screams 82 and 80 to me. Like I really like what they're building here. I think Riley Green and Spencer Torkelson could be building blocks for a very long time. On top of you know having a guy like Scooball as your ace for a long time as well. I think it's probably a year away, and I wouldn't be shocked, especially if the Tigers are aggressive in the offseason next year. Like, if they are World Series contenders in 2025, if guys continue to make that step, if Javi Baez can be anything but, you know, just god-awful, unfortunately, it has not been fun to watch. Like, there's a lot to like about this Tigers teams in terms of talent. I just think they might be one year away. I think that might be true about the next team we're going to talk about here in the Kansas City Royals. Uh, Cole Reagans, a guy that I think we have talked about in 67 straight podcasts. Somehow we talked about him last week. No, we didn't. Uh, over under Cole Reagans, a 3.25 ERA. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of buzzy pitchers. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go under, I'll, I'll drink the Cole Reagans Kool-Aid. I mean, he just, he figured something out the velocity uptick. I mean, he's, he's held that over into the spring as well. Sure. And just looks fantastic. Um, decent park to pitch in. Yeah. Um, Royals defense, uh, so-so. But, I mean, I think we have to see him do it over a full season for sure um, as a member of the rotation. But I'm completely buying into Cole Reagan's as a breakout candidate. I'll take the under on the 3 two, 5 yeah, I totally get it. I'm going to take the over just because I think there will be some command issues at times that are going to ruin that ERA a little bit. Like some starts where he goes three and a third innings, gives up three runs with four walks and four strikeouts, you know, and that can really put a damper on it. He's also going to have seven innings of shutout baseball too because the stuff is that good. It's been really fun to see Cole Reagans as a former top prospect who just could not find the strike zone and struggled to stay on the bump a little bit as well. It's been fun to see him find that stuff. And even at an ERA of 3-4-3-5, plenty of fantasy relevance, uh, in part because I actually think Kansas City might be pretty good. We'll get there in just a sec. Uh, over under Vinny Pasquantino, a 7.85 OPS. Way over. Nice. Yeah, I, I, know, I know he finished below that ultimately last year, but you look at his start to the season before the shoulder issues – Cropped up, he was fantastic. I mean, yeah. I think that he was in you know roughly half ish of a season in 2022 is basically what can we we can expect from him. I mean, I think he's going to be a 850 OPS guy plus regularly. Nice. That's aggressive. That's aggressive. I'm going to go over as well. I'm thinking more like that 820 OPS. Uh, Actually, when we was doing my keeper show a couple of weeks ago, I got asked a couple of questions about whether or not Pasquantino uh, should be kept over Torkelson. I'll ask you that one right now. Which one do you like better? I prefer Vinny P. Uh, right. I'm going to, I mean, if you're just going home run total, going Torque, but I think he's the, Vinny P is the better all around hitter and fantasy option. Every time I say his name, I just want pasta. Like, give me some cacio e pepe right now, man. That sounds... <laughs> That's my favorite pasta dish, too. Oh, it's so good. Uh, pretty pretty fun one here. Over under Bobby Witt Jr., fantasy rank, end of the year. I meant to say for shortstops here, Ryan, but so I'm um, okay. prepared here. Uh, 1.5 for shortstops, Bobby Witt Jr. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an important qualifier. Right? It sure is, Ryan. Um, for shortstops, I'll take the, I'll take the under. I mean, he is, well, you know what, just for the odds, I guess I'll have to take the over. 
Oh. But if you're going to give me one pick to finish as the number one shortstop, I'm going to pick Bobby Witt, but I think you got to take the field, right? Who's so who's the top competitors to Witt Jr. to finish in that number one spot, like on paper? Uh, Trey Turner. Okay. Francisco Lindor. I so, just can't see either of those guys catching Witt Jr., man. Like, because of the fact that I think that I – well, it's not even I think – I know what Trey Turner could do stolen base wise if they if he actually wanted to. Yeah. But I know Bobby Wood Jr. was to steal 60 bases. And I think there's a very good chance that Bobby Wood Jr., assuming he gets off to a good start. And it's worth pointing out, Bobby Wood Jr. finished extremely high last year, not playing all that great to begin the year. He's just a special talent to me, man. And honestly, the more I think about it, I'm going to take the over on Bobby Wood Jr. at 1.5 for everybody. I'm going to say right now that Bobby Wood Jr. ends up leading all of baseball and fantasy points. I'm going to predict that he finishes with around 38 homers, around 55 stolen bases, an average right around 270, uh, score a bunch of runs for, I think, an extremely underrated Kansas City lineup. I'm going to take the over. I am all in on Bobby Wood Jr., man. Like, this is a guy that I've been screaming about since he was a uh, shortstop in Texas in high school. Just, you know, it's so funny because his profile is so different than his dad, who was a uh, slow throwing pitcher who uh, initiated ground balls. Bobby Wood Jr., the exact. Does that mean you're a little bit worried about Acuna, or is it just more that you love? A little bit. A little bit. Um, I do think that uh, the fact, like when Acuna tweeted, I'll be back, that actually scared the crap out of me. Like, it, I would have preferred him just to say, like, this is no big deal. By the way, I loved his clap back to the guy who said that he was playing in Winter League. And he said, well, I played last year and I was the MVP. So um, I, I just think Bobby Witt Jr. is a special player. And I think that you're going to see Bobby Witt Jr. Um, in part because I have a lot of his rookie cards. And oh, my goodness gracious, do I need that money? The over under on the Kansas City Royals is way too low, Ryan. It's 73.5 wins. I'll just go first. Way over. I think the Kansas City Royals finished second in this division. I really like this roster. Uh, are you agreeing with me? Oh, yeah. This was the easiest call in this division by far. Um, I don't know if they're going to win the division, but I think they can compete for it. Sure. I suspect that they're going to finish with 80 something wins. Yeah, I, the the reason why I think the over under is so low here is because they were so bad last year. Like, seventy three wins is a seventeen win jump from what they did in twenty twenty three. So I get it from that point. But the just if that team can stay healthy, if Nelson Velasquez can continue his upswing, if Vinny Pasquantino can be the hitter that we just talked about, if Bobby Witt Jr. is that guy, if Cole Riggins is a legitimate top of the rotation starter. In this crap shack of a division, it's really easy for me to see them being a contender. And that's in part because I don't love this next team we're going to talk about to finish the AL Central, Minnesota. But I will say I'm a big fan of Matt Walner. I set a pretty high one here, Ryan. Over under 27.5 homers for Walner in 2024. You did set it high. I'm going to I'm gonna take the over, though. Nice. Um, I mean, he might also – I might also take the over on 100 and – 90 strikeout. Sure, sure. Not a well-rounded player, but there might not be uh, a home run swing with just such raw power that I like watching more. Yeah. Like he, he hit some bombs last year, just absolute tanks. Like when he gets a hold of it, it's – and surprisingly, target field actually is a pretty decent – place to hit for left-handed power mm -hmm. above average like just looking at that place with the high wall and, and right it seems like it should be a little more difficult than it is but ranks pretty well for left-handed power so i'm going to take the over on that wall i'm going to take the over as well the joey gallo comps are so easy to make here except for a better approach at the plate in my personal opinion one of the other rated things too is matt walner has an absolutely like an arm that you need to check in at the way at the airport type of thing, because he just absolutely can gun it. Expected slugging percentage. It was five seventeen. barreled the baseball 18.8% of the time. That is an obscene number, especially for a player with as little experience as Matt Walner has. 
Wouldn't shock me if he's among the league leaders in homers next year. 35 to 40, well within range as long as he can keep those strikeouts to a low roar. Not 100% convinced he can do that, but I'll believe he'll take just enough of a tick up there, maybe at the expense of the walks a little bit, maybe a little more assertive in the yeah. earlier parts of the counts, but that should also help with the homers because if you throw this guy a fastball, uh, best of luck to you. Uh, might need to get those helmets that they were wearing uh, for just a second there for the pitchers because this guy's just unbelievably strong. Uh, Royce Lewis, one of my all-time favorite prospects as well. Over, under... I actually thought about setting this number a little higher. 285 average for Royce Lewis. Yeah, I'm going I'm going higher. Um, I have like basically zero concerns performance-wise for Royce Lewis. Like he's done it everywhere he's been. The stack ass data backs up the service level numbers. Like I think he's if he can stay healthy. Granted, big if. I just think he's going to be a stud and 285. Maybe he needs a little bad luck, but I would, I would take the over. Yep. I'm absolutely going the over as well. I thought about setting this number at 301 or something like that, just because I think his hit tool competes with the best in baseball. And you know what? <laughs> the concerns with him are going to be health. Like there could be some bad, uh, um, luck where he has in this season end very early or something like that. And I'm knocking on all the wood possible that this happens, but the yep. rates are going to be there for Royce Lewis. Like as long as he's on the field, he's going to do some really good things. I'm not as convinced that the other twins are going to do over great things. Ryan, the over under here is 86, which is easily the lowest of any division favorite. You take it. Oh, that's not true because we're the NL Central is also not exactly in love either here, but they're easily the favorite in the AL Central is what I meant to say. Are you taking the over on the Twins at 86? No, I'm going to take the under. I'm with you in, in thinking that they're a lot closer to the rest of the pack in that division than, yep. than a lot of other people think. Uh, I mean, if you had made me pick a team to ultimately win the division, I think I'd probably still pick the Twins, but... Yep. I would take the the under on 86 wins. Yeah, I would as well. And it would not shock me if we get an 82 or 83 win team that wins this division, even with the balanced schedule, just because the other teams are going to beat up on these guys. Like as much as I love Kansas City, like what they're doing, as much as I uh, said nice things about Detroit, you put them in the AL East or the AL West, they are pretty easily near the bottom, even with uh, Oakland being a team that we will uh, – Struggle to do some over-unders with, I think, to be completely honest with you. Same with Colorado. I think I'm going to take the under here. I would probably just stay away from it because I do think they'll win that division. But it is not – it's darning with faint praise. This is a really bad division. Hey, speaking of bad divisions, let's move to the NL Central. Let's start with the Cubs. Uh, Albert Alzale, 29.5 saves, over or under? I'm going under. I worry about the health. Um, that he's had numerous arm issues. Um, I mean, if you, given where they're being drafted, I would rather have Hector Neris out of those two relievers. Um, so I'm not so much worried about the him from a performance standpoint. I think the skills are there, but not convinced that he will stay healthy, and I'm also not convinced he's better than than Hector Neris. So I'll take the under. Yeah, that's a good point. The Hector Neris thing really does kind of make things interesting there. I'll still take the over um, just because I think I can see Council maybe using Neris more as the high leverage guy in that type of situation. Although, you know, we've seen Council definitely have set closers, so it's not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination. The guy who's pitching the best is going to get that job. I just like Alzale's stuff a lot. The health concerns are legitimate, but I do think he'll hit the over on there. Cody Bellinger, one of the uh, most risky guys, I think, for any over-under because uh, we've seen so much good and so much not so much. Let's say an 825 OPS. Are you taking an over or under on that for Bellinger? It's funny because, I mean, his OPS is probably either going to be 950 or 650, right? Correct. <laughs> Nothing in between? Yeah. I would – I'm going to take the under. Um I mean, we've we've spoken on this podcast before that great year for Cody Bellinger last year, but the batted ball data really wasn't very good. 
Um, yeah. Did make strides from a strikeout perspective, legitimate improvement there. I'm not totally buying into the the power though. Uh, I'll, I'll take the under on eight twenty five. Yeah, I'll take the under as well, but I still think he's going to be a solid player. Like he's always going to be a solid real life player because of his defense and the value that he adds on the bases as well. Uh, kind of underrated in that value. But I think the batting data is a really good point. I don't think he's a guy who's going to hit for a very high average. I think he might sell out for a little more pop this year, you know, knowing that uh, the ability to opt out, you know, is something that I think is going to be big for him. And maybe if he can show 35 to 40 homer potential again, that could be something that adds to it. So I'll go under, but I'm going to guess more like 810, 820 still makes him a very solid real life player. The over under here is 84.5. Ryan, what you got? I'm taking the under. Um, not crazy about the Cubs roster top to bottom. I, bringing Bellinger back certainly helps. I still don't love that lineup. Um, and I maybe Kate Horton can come up and provide something, but I'm not, I don't think there's a ton of upside in that rotation either. Um, they're in the right division, certainly. But I think they're more of like a 500 team, so I'll take the I'll take the under. Yeah, I'm going to take the under as well. Although I do, there's something in my head that tells me that they, if they get off to a little bit of a slow start, they're going to be aggressive with that roster and maybe add some stuff that could put them into that over. But I just don't think they can separate enough from the pack in this group of very even baseball teams. Like, and that is not a compliment. A lot of teams that are extremely flawed in this division, but I don't think the Cubs are way better than any of these guys. They are the favorite, according to this, to win the division. I actually think another team should be the favorite that we'll get to in a second. In fact, we'll get to it right now. The Cincinnati Reds. Over under EDLC, 60 homers and steals. You betting on some combo meals for Mr. De La Cruz? <sighs> yeah, I think I'm going to take the the over here. Um I know I've spoken to my some my concerns that I have with him. Sure, there is potentially some bottom out potential there. He it's a non zero chance he could find himself back in the minors if things go really poorly. I don't think that'll happen though. And even in, even if he just strikes out at a super high rate, he showed an inclination to just steal bases whenever he got on base and. Even if it's going to be a lot of inconsistency, I think he's going to do enough, especially from a stolen base perspective, to clear the the 60 threshold between homers and steals. Yeah, I think so as well. It wouldn't shock me if the steals are considerably higher, as good as L.A. De La Cruz's power is, are substantially higher. Like I could see him hitting 25 homers but stealing 45 to 50 bases because the speed's so good, and he's such an aggressive player too. Like. The Cincinnati Reds are not going to be able to get this guy to stop running. There is going to be no uh, red light. It's not going to matter. He's going to get some parking tickets or some speeding tickets or whatever the heck you'd get for running a red light. Um, but I will take the over on that. Uh, over under Hunter Green, 1.24 whip. I'm going to take the over. Um, you know, Hunter Green, with that stuff, he should not be allowing a hit per inning. Yeah. Like, like the fastball's way too hittable for what it is. I mean, you yep. look at he's a guy you're going to find on pitching ninja plenty. Uh, yeah, the stuff is great. I really hope he takes a step forward. I'm not ruling it out, and I do think he's a pretty going to be a pretty solid fantasy option, but not great control and gives up too many hits for a guy with the stuff that he has. So I'm going to take the over on that. On that, yeah. I'm going to take the over as well, and I'm just going to ask the Reds to get Hunter Green the heck out of Cincinnati because he just doesn't profile well there. Like the fact that he doesn't initiate ground balls and the fact that he does have his command issues, it's just a bad park for him. 152 strikeouts and 112 innings tells you how good this guy's swing and miss stuff is. Like, And if he can stay healthy... I do think a breakout year is possible. It seems like Hunter Brown is Hunter Brown. Hunter Green has been around for a long time. He's still only 24, Ryan. Like that is still a young profile that I think we haven't seen the best from. 
But I do think that if you are a fantasy guy who, you know, and you are, or fantasy girl who is listening to this show, um, if you're concerned about whip, then you're going to have to be really careful about Hunter Green. If you need help in the strikeout category, especially rates, go all over Hunter Green. The over-under here is 82 wins. I'm going over. I think that the Reds are the best team in this division. I think the young talent here is going to be enough for them to uh, overcome that awful, awful, awful chili or whatever the heck they call it. It's just disgusting, but pretty good baseball team. See, I thought I was going to have the hot take about the Reds being the best team in the division, but it sounds yep. like you are in locks up here, buddy. <laughs> um, obviously, the Noel Lee Marte news dings them a little bit, um, but I still think they're probably the best team in the division, and yeah. I like the over on the, on the 82 wins. I do too. Like, I, Well, I just said it. I don't have to do it again. Let's Let's move on. The Milwaukee Brewers – who I think before some moves would have been the overwhelming favorite here, but not can't be that anymore, but do have some interesting pieces. Let's start with Jackson Churio, 24.5 stolen bases over or under for 2024. I'll go over. Um, I mean, he sold like 20 more than that in the minors last year ish. Uh, he's incredibly young. I don't, I don't know if, we're going to see the full potential in, in 2024, but the young guys are normally aggressive. I think he's going to get the green light on the base paths. So even if the full offensive game isn't quite there, I think he's going to steal a good number of bases. So I'll take the over. Yeah, absolutely. That I'm going to go the over as well. And it's why I think Churio should be on your bench uh, for roster spots, just because uh, I have some concerns about every other statistic, but because this guy speeds so good and because I do think Milwaukee is going to be looking to be aggressive on the bases, I think he's going to do pretty well. I uh, also think Sal Frelick can help in that. I was going to mention Sal Frelick for the over-under category, but we are now, this is now a six-hour show, so we'll try to cut it down to eight hours. Let's talk about Aaron Ashby, though, because I think he's become a lot more interesting after the moves Milwaukee has made. How about an over-under of 3.99 ERA for Aaron Ashby? I got to take the over. Um, I mean, I've really, really been an Aaron Ashby fan in the past. I mean, the guys, a guy who misses that many bats and gets that many ground balls is just very enticing. I don't know how he's going to come back from the shoulder surgery. Um, late last year, the velocity was down. It's been up a little bit more this spring is that going to hold he's also got control issues um i think you gotta take the over on the on that year right yeah i'm going to as well i do like the stuff here i think he could be a guy who helps in a couple other categories but that's just a little bit too much to ask i think for ashby and over that number i'm not sure how fantasy relevant he is to be honest because i'm not sure milwaukee's going to score a lot of runs which brings us to their over-under, 76.5 wins. Yeah, I'm going to take the under. Um, I'm with you that, you know, if the offseason could have gone a little differently, there. this could be a pretty decent team, but it, it did not. Um, it's a bad division. 76.5 is not a super high total, but I'm just not super interested in this roster. I'll take the under. Yeah, I'm going to take the over, but not by much. I think this... You know, I, I talked about a roster scream in 78 and 84 a couple of days ago. And this roster screams 79 and 83 to me. It's not terrible, but it's not good enough, even in a pretty mediocre division. So I will take the over, but not by a whole heck of a lot. Uh, moving on to the Pirates over under O'Neill Cruz, who I'm just not seeing a whole heck of a lot of talk about O'Neill Cruz, which is kind of weird for a talent like him. Let's set the number at a 770 OPS, over or under for 2024. I'll take the over. Um, yeah, I really hope we see a full-on O'Neill Cruz breakout because he's he's so fun. But relative to I – mean, there are a lot of L.A. De La Cruz comps because they're small forwards playing shortstop. Um, but, but we just don't hear as, as much, I don't think. I think I agree with the – if we don't hear as much about Ono Cruz as we do as L.A. De-, De La Cruz. Sure. 770 OPS. There are certainly play discipline issues, but 
I think he's going to have enough raw talent to carry past that 70, 70, 770 number. Yeah, as I was writing this one out, I kind of struggled with it because I went back and forth. I think it's a perfectly fair number, by the way. Just, you know, really good job by me. But I think a 330 on base percentage and a 440 slugging percentage is perfectly reasonable. That puts you right at that number. A little bit better and certainly has the talent for it. Just be prepared to take some bitter with better with O'Neill Cruz because the approach is just disgustingly bad. There are going to be some times where he... You might even think about taking out of your lineup, but there's going to be some times where he might just individually win you a week. Uh, over under Livy Dunn's boyfriend, a.k.a. Paul Skeen's 8.5 starts for the Pittsburgh Pirates in 2024, a.k.a. is Paul Skeen's worth a draft pick in redraft leagues? Uh, I don't know if he's worth a draft pick on, in redraft leagues, but I'll still take the over on okay. eight. Um some boxes he needs to check, they say, in the minors. Um, I do think uh, he gets deemed for his fastball shape by scouts. I think there could be some more growing pains than what we suspect from a guy with uh, just, you know, watching him how lights out he can be. Um, but it sounds like Jared Jones is going to arrive probably before him. Um He's another interesting guy as well, but certainly not on Skeens' level. Eight and a half stars, so I, I think we'll see him in the first half. I'm going to take the over. Okay, and I think if he does make nine to ten starts for the Pirates, or you know, if it jumps up to something like 12, that does make him fantasy relevant, and I would consider him, definitely considering him in NL-only leagues. In redraft leagues, I'd probably just be prepared to spend some fab for him because his swing and miss potential is through the roof. Now, I... We talked a bunch about how it's ridiculous that people thought he's a better pitching prospect than Yamamoto, in part because Yamamoto shouldn't be a pitching prospect. What he did in Japan makes yeah. him not a prospect. I have some concerns about that fastball shape. My buddy RJ Anderson of CBS Sports, who does an awesome job with this stuff, also has some concerns about it. But when you put up that kind of swing and miss totals in the SEC, which is high A-level baseball, you have to be ready to add this guy to a roster I think he's a better long-term play, but I do – I'm going to actually take the under on the number, though, because I think we might see Paul Skeens up and maybe used as a reliever at first just because I don't think Pittsburgh's going to be very good, and I imagine maybe they are just kind of uh, building him into it, obviously, long-term for a starter. Um, a lot of people – well, two people commenting on my Livy Dunn boyfriend comment. Look. She's more famous than him. It's one of the rare occasions where that happens, where a number one overall pick is not as famous as their significant other. Um, but that, he he's won one in that draft too. He, he did he did well for himself. He did okay. He did okay. I think the Pittsburgh Pirates might be okay in 2024, but not much better than that. The over under is 75 wins. What you got, buddy? I also think they're going to be okay ish. Um, and they're in a division that's less than okay-ish. I'll take. I, I think they're going to be better than the Brewers. Uh, <laughs> I missed that comment. I tried yeah, to okay. play real quick, but yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to take the over. I think they're going to finish fourth in the division, probably. Um, probably fall shy of 80 wins, but I'll take the over in 75. So somewhat surprisingly, this team won more than 75 games last year, which I think people are forgetting about. I actually think the Pirates might be a better baseball team with a worse record than last year. Maybe a little <laughs> bit less one-run luck. They do have a nice bullpen, although Colin Holderman, man, that guy was overworked to say the very least. I think that's one of the reasons why they added a role as Chapman to work behind David Bednar. I'm going to guess 73 to 74 wins or 73 to 74, 70 to 74 wins. Uh, they'll, but they won't get 73 and a half wins. I promise you that I'm going to take the under, but it's not by a whole heck of a lot. Let's end with Ryan's favorite. Everything those St. Louis Cardinals. He loves them so much. And I'm starting with the kind of ugly one, which kind of tells you why I'm not a huge fan of this team over under 9.5 pitchers that will make starts for the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, this is just me. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to take the over, by the way. <laughs> yeah. we're, already, we're already starting out with, with six right out of the gate because Sonny yeah. Gray is start on the injured list. Yeah. I'm guessing Zach Thompson's going to get a gets, gets a few starts. Um, maybe, maybe Matthew Libertor. 
I mean, on one from one perspective, the whole reason they got these uh, pitchers that all need their AARP card is they're supposed to be <laughs> you're supposed to be count on them for thirty plus starts. And yeah, maybe that's the case. But also, old pitchers can get hurt. Um, so you're already starting out with six, and I think the odds are probably against them. So I'll take I'll take the over. Yeah, I'm taking the over as well. I have some real concerns about this rotation. And, you know, there are some interesting young arms that I think could get a chance this year as well, which is the optimistic way of saying that I think it's going to hit the over. Um, Tink Hentz is really interesting to me. Gordon Crisifo is still a name that I think, like, wasn't great last year, but I still think has a chance to be a decent little back-end starter. And I could also see... If these guys aren't working out, St. Louis being like, we got to be aggressive. We have a good farm system. We have some young talent. We need to address this rotation. Uh, we've got two here. You pick which one you want to do here, Ryan. Over under Jordan Walker, 26.5 homers, or over under 245 average Nolan Gorman? I think we did Jordan Walker for the tease on the district. Oh, yeah. Well, let's do Jordan Walker. Let's do Jordan Walker. Um it's all about whether he's going to be able to, be able to elevate the ball. Um, he certainly hits the ball hard enough. I think he'll figure out how to put it in the air enough. You know, overall, uh, from a fantasy perspective, a disappointing season. But, I mean, as a 20-year-old, he had like oh. a 114 OPS plus. I mean, he, perfectly solid first year. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that power is going to, going to manifest – enough to where he can hit the ball near enough and 30 home runs may be a stretch, but I'll take the over on 26 and a half. I'll take the over as well. I don't think that that to say the expectations were too high for Jordan Walker coming into the year are quite the understatement. Like yeah. I think we expected him to be that Julio Rodriguez type of player. And that's just not fair for every Julio Rodriguez. We get a lot of seasons that aren't so great for players that young I am a huge believer in his talent. I do believe he will drive the baseball a lot more. I'm going over. Uh, one word answer on the Nolan Gorman 245. Uh, over or under? Under. Under as well for me. But I still like Nolan Gorman quite a bit. I'm allowed to say more words because I'm the host. Over, under, 85 wins. They're considered the favorites to win this division, Ryan. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not super optimistic. Um Maybe I'm too close to the situation and I'm just yeah. going to be a negative Nelly, but I'm taking the under on 80, 85 wins. Just not – I like the offense quite a bit, but they're going to be down now two starting outfielders probably, it sounds like, at the beginning of the season in addition yeah. to their number one starter. Um, there are some aspects about the roster I like, but yeah. – 85 wins, I'm going to unfortunately take the under. I'm going to take the under as well, and it leads me to this, which I just came up with in my head. Oh Over under, the teams that we just talked about, 0 0.5 postseason series wins. Uh, postseason series wins? I mean, I think you have to take the under. Yeah, I think so as well. The centrals are kind of rough right now, buddy. Like, it's interesting though, because I do think there's a lot of young talent in these divisions. Like it competes, I think with any of the divisions in terms of just pure, like young talent that can help in the coming years, but it's 2024 and they're not ready to be at that level yet. I can't see any of these teams doing damage in the postseason. Now we've yeah. obviously seen that a lot can happen in the postseason as well. Right. And I'll say this too. None of these teams competing for a wild card spot. Right. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I, that's another thing with the, you know, the one one postseason series win. There are so many really really good teams in the National League. Yeah, uh, kind of the haves and have nots to a certain degree. There are a lot of really bad teams too, but the the winner of this division is going to squeak into the playoffs and go up against. Chances are they're going to go up against one of the juggernauts. So I'll I'll take the under on series win. Still love you, Central. We love you. We love Steak and Shake. We love, I think Culver's is in the Midwest too. I, I don't know. Like there's, 
There's, there's some good stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. I wasn't going to bring it up, but yeah, I'm the big 4 1 today. And you're welcome to the 4 1 club. We're Thank 40, you, my friend. 41 year olds sitting here. With, hey, that, and you know what? Good for us as 41 year olds for knowing who Livy Dunn is. Like, I think that uh, it shows that we're, uh, we're up, we're hip, we're pretty cool. Hey, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, and again, we really appreciate everyone who's coming out to these YouTube streams. We have them every single day of the week. Tomorrow, I'm going to be joined by the great DVR, Eric, aka Derek Van Ripper. I think one of the most underrated fantasy names in the sport. And we're going to be talking about some ADP stuff. So we'd really appreciate it if you check that out. Um, follow me on whatever they call that website at Crawford underscore MILB. Follow Ryan at Ryan P. Boyer. Really appreciate the support. We will be back next week. Um, sorry, Central. You're just, you're not very good.